Let's come before the Lord. Let's pray. O oh, blessed God and our Father, we ask now for thy help as we come to worship, we together on the Lord's Day. Lord, warm our hearts and help us, O oh Lord, to lift up our eyes to thee, to look to thee, to worship and to trust in thee. Hear our prayers in Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's turn to Acts. The Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 3, and we read the first 10 verses. Acts chapter 3, the book of Acts chapter 3, and from verse 1 to verse 10. Hear the word of God. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked, for, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which has happened unto him. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading to our hearts. We'll have the notices now. Welcome to the evening service. Meetings this week, Lord willing, on Tuesday, the fellowship in the hall at 10.15am. On Wednesday, the midweek meeting at 7.30pm. Friday is youth meeting at 7.30pm for 18 plus at the home of Alan and Helen Hyam. On Saturday, the Persian meeting continues on Zoom at 10 a.m. Next Lord's Day follows the same pattern as today, starting with a prayer meeting at 9.30 a.m. in the hall, and then services at 10.30, 3.30, and 6 p.m., Lord willing. There's no free will offering during the service, but if you wish to contribute to the work of the gospel here, please speak to the stewards. Now I'll remain seated to sing while this re recording is played. And the hymn is 274, or what matchless condescension. 274.
passed through lines, but it worked somehow. Well, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank Thee for the mercies and the grace of the Gospel. We thank Thee, Lord, there is forgiveness in this world. Uh, we were born in sin and born into a world of sin and continue our sin. And without the grace of God, we would have died in our sins. But, O oh Lord, we thank Thee for speaking to us, for bringing to us the Word of God, and, O oh Lord, to declare to us that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. That Christ is the atonement. He is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. O oh Lord, we thank Thee for this revelation in the Word and this revelation in our heart too. How the Spirit spoke to our hearts, and not only to convince our minds, uh, but to move our souls. And O oh Lord, there we trusted in Christ. We loved Him, and we believed in Him, and we followed Him. And so we continue this evening to follow our blessed Saviour. O oh Father, we ask uh, that Thou would walk with us, that our Saviour would walk with us as He did with the two men on the road to Emmaus. We might know how heart burned within us with His nearness. And yet, O oh Lord, we so often find that we are apart from Him and are gone our own way. But Lord, we ask that we shall obey the ways of the Lord and find ourselves uh, beside our Saviour, next to our blessed Saviour. Lord, we pray now that it might be so even this evening, that uh, we might walk together as brothers, but also with our Saviour. What a blessed gospel this is, as we think of the darkness of the world and how dismal it is and gloomy, how materialistic, how limited. And yet we find in this gospel peace of heart, forgiveness of sins. We know fellowship with God, uh, reconciliation, to know the one who made us, our creator. We know paradise regained and more in our Saviour. And all of these blessings which we have known, whatever we have known, there is so much more. And, O oh Father, we ask that we may prove these things day by day, year by year. And even now, O oh Lord, this evening be with us. O oh Father, we ask the Spirit may come. Rest upon the Word of God and rest upon our hearts. And the Lord, speak to us, comfort us, challenge us too, and bless us. And at the end of it, O oh, Father, that we might know the Lord, might know Thee. We do ask for this service to keep it. Protect us, O oh Lord, from the evil one. Protect us all from evil. As we think of our families and our friends uh, in this world. And we are called upon to pray such things, that we might indeed uh, be kept from evil. And we do pray. And not only to be kept from evil, but to our Lord to be kept in good things and blessing. Uh, we ask this for our families, ourselves, and individuals. Pray, Lord, for our dear church here. Pray for other churches too who love thy name. And in these days, O oh Lord, we might know a great fraternity of pastors and people of churches. We might know each other, and we might work together, and we might pray together. And, O oh Lord, uh, we might uh, give due glory to God. Uh, we might speak the same message of Christ crucified and call upon men to look upon Jesus and to be saved. So we pray these things for the prosperity and the keeping of the churches. We might follow, Lord, all of those churches which perhaps have few attending or in circumstances are very challenged. And uh, there are these fellowships throughout the country. We remember each other, have a heart for each other, and pray that the gospel work in those places might be maintained. They might know uh, the providences, perhaps, of people coming and uh, giving a great boost to the work. Or perhaps uh, there might be um, some other circumstance which uh, might encourage them 
some provision, some providence, might be a token for good, the work might continue, and they might be strengthened. And not the churches which are more self-sufficient, who might be kept, how fragile we all are at best. And we pray, Lord, that the gospel calls in these times, Lord, might prosper as we think of this time of pandemic and lockdown and restrictions and see how these things have challenged the people of God. Lord, let us gather ourselves. Let us rally around the banner of truth and let us continue with the days we have allotted to us that we might uh, find ourselves uh, revived in our spirits. Uh, we might find ourselves quickened and um, stirred up as the heart of Zerubbabel was stirred up. And these things are necessary, O oh Lord, because as we see in the scriptures and uh, we see with uh, men like Zerubbabel and others in the Old Testament, uh, there were times of slackness, of uh, forgetting, and there was a need for reviving, for a touch of God. And so we see from time to time uh, these stirrings. We pray that we might know a stirring. So hear our prayers. Bless us, O oh Lord, now, today. Put thy good hand upon us. To thy glory. Amen. Well, we'll sing him 69 Sam. I bless the Christ of God. Six nine seven.
me to this third chapter of the book of Acts and the verses 1 to 10. And this third chapter follows on from the great events of chapter 2, Pentecost, where 3,000 were saved and the apostles preached the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now here in chapter 3, we join Peter and John on their way to pray at the temple. Uh, we are told some details at 3 in the afternoon or the ninth hour, as is mentioned here. And as they approach the temple, they come across a man lame from birth at the gate. And seeing Peter and John approach, he begins to beckon them, beg them for money, for alms. And both Peter and John fix their eyes on him, and Peter says these striking words, look on us. And so the lame man looked with expectation, no doubt expecting some gift. And Peter says, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Quite surprising words to the ears of this man. And Peter took this man by the right hand and lifted him to his feet. And immediately we are told his feet and his legs were strong. Yeah, and that is just remarkable, uh, the whole event, uh, not just he could walk, but uh, that he could do it straight away. And uh, not only did he stand, he leapt to his feet. And not only did he walk, he walked and leaped, praising God. Not just the miracle of walking, but the way he walked, or rather leaped. The people, understandably, were filled with amazement. And as Peter and John moved and made towards the temple, a lame man that had been healed clinged to Peter and John. And more people gathered around them. And suddenly Peter and John were the center of attention. And the people were giving them the glory. At which point, as we see, verses 10, 11 and 12 there, uh, as the people were gathering around with wonder, Peter addresses the people. And so follows the second sermon of Peter, the first one being at Pentecost. And we see here another sermon by Peter. And so this evening I want to divide our message into three parts. Uh, first of all, taking the words of Peter, look on us. And then seeing Peter's response to the attention and in so many words says, don't look at us. And then goes on as he begins uh, to preach in his sermon. He essentially says, not only don't look at us, look on Jesus. Well, let's think of those things. And as we take the first matter and the account as before us, and this matter of Peter saying, look on us, and the facts surrounding that, you know when you can look at a, a few words sometimes and so much can be in those words. Uh, it's not just a, a sentence or two. There's so much in there. And the details are so fascinating and revealing. And that's the case here, I think. So much can be said about the simple facts, not just the miraculous and the astounding, but the simple facts say much to us this evening. And first of all, we see two brothers, uh, Peter and John, walking together to the house of God. It's a lovely sight. It speaks again of being in one accord in one place. It's a beautiful picture. It reminds me of something I read years ago in a book of, I think, a revival in America. I think it was in the seminary. And somebody looking from a window above, looking at the men, uh, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, in fellowship and in bonds of unity. Where well, this predates that, of course, here we see 
Peter and John walking together to the temple, to the house of God. And also we see in that simple fact, faithfulness to the means of grace, to the house of God. They were making their way to the temple to pray. Now we know from chapter 2, they met in their homes. They also at this time were meeting in the temple. It's a simple matter, but we note it and we know the significance of it. It's a lovely matter. It's a heart matter. And these men were going together to the house of God to pray. And really it's much more here, but even with those opening words, uh, we have telling truths. And we see particularly an alertness and a readiness as they approach the gate uh, where this man was asking alms. They were alert to opportunities. And Peter, without hesitation, sees this man, this man, looking to them for arms, for money, and he fastens his eyes on the man, as does John, and says, look on us. And he speaks not only of inward warmth, but outward compassion, an alertness for men and women, and a desire to speak to men, a heart desire to tell men of Jesus Christ. And so they did with this man. They were ready straight away. In the blink of an eye, they were ready. And they were speaking to this man of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What is more, we note a few other things here as we add these things on top of each other. All these small details that build up to, I think, a lovely picture. Uh, they had a heart for the poor and needy and the insignificant. You know, even though we wish we were different, how many walk past such people in our times and other times? Uh, and perhaps thinking it's not worth our bother to share the gospel with such a man is uh, perhaps an awkward encounter and maybe uh, the man is in a poor state or perhaps we do it uh, to solve our consciences as an afterthought or as an extra and none of that is the way of the Lord uh, if we think like that or act like that we do not follow Jesus and his ways and all the example of the apostles it is striking of all the people, they pick on this lame man and say to him, look on us. And he shows the worth of a soul. And we must understand that. Our Savior showed us time and time again the worth of a soul. Regardless of outward appearance, when you see somebody, you see a soul. And the importance of all souls and of one soul, one soul. That's where it begins, not with the crowds. It begins with the understanding. Oh, a soul, an immortal soul. And of course, that soul is important to that man. But is it important to us? Well, it was to Peter and John. And they fixed their eyes on him. It's a, it's a powerful picture. And there they were, people milling around. This lame man, they fixed their eyes on him and say, Look on us. It's wonderful. We have a wonderful gospel that remembers the insignificant and all kinds of people. Well, we also see here, although surprisingly perhaps, an example of giving alms, of giving to the poor, although it would seem to be otherwise. But look carefully at the words. Um, clearly, they have no silver and gold upon their persons. But very clearly, if they had silver and gold on them, they would have given. Do you think otherwise? Do you think if they had silver and gold, they were not interested? Of course they were. It was their way. We have to go, we don't have to go far to see how they gave to the poor, how Jesus Christ gave to the poor, how they gave to the poor. And many times we see in the epistles a mention 
of giving to the poor and looking after the poor and needy. It was their way, but they had no money on them. But by the same token of what is, I think, an obvious willingness, because they were saying, we don't have silver and gold. It's almost as if they were saying, if we had silver and gold, we would give it. But providentially, perhaps, they had none. And so they spoke of another silver and gold. Not just the healing of this man's body and his lameness, but the saving of the soul. If you read on, you'll see marks of that. And they speak of his complete healing, his body and soul. This man was saved. He believed, had faith in Jesus Christ. And he received much more than the silver and gold of this world, the silver and gold of heaven, or the one who is unsearchable riches, the one who is the hidden treasure, and the one who is the pearl of great price. What a fortune, what a fortune this man received. He asked for pennies, he received a treasure. The treasure, the hidden treasure. Jesus Christ. What a gift he had. The unspeakable gift. But also we can't pass by and we must notice the manner of speaking. The boldness and unction of their words. Uh, this is a mark of the Holy Spirit, this boldness. Uh, you can't just produce this of your own will and desire. And it's very different to self-confidence. Self-confidence, it's quite charming and quite seductive even, but only really brings attention to the person. But to be filled with the Holy Spirit is something of another quality altogether. And yes, for sure, the apostles were faithful and showing godliness and being practical. But what we see here is something more. This boldness is God-given. How can you explain this? They could not decide to heal this man other than they were filled with the Spirit. And with a God-given confidence and boldness told him to get up. These things are from the Lord. What we have here is God. God coming into the situation. God coming to Peter and to John and to this lame man. And we see the whole situation speaks of the Lord. Fix their eyes upon him. Look on us. Get up in the name of Jesus. Nazareth. Stretch out. Lift him up by the right hand. And so he leaps up. Oh my friend, you cannot, you cannot explain those things other than this was the unction and anointing. This was the same power of Pentecost. But here we see in this one singular instance with this lame man, God, the power of God, was in that event. And the boldness, the power of those words, look on us. And then, of course, he proceeds then uh, to call them, uh, to call him rather, uh, to walk and to get up. But then, yes, look on us, but also, very quickly, they say, don't look on us. As we continue our count, and the people were gathering around, and the focus was very much on the apostles, uh, as you might, you might ex expect. And they were giving them credit, even giving them the glory. And essentially what Peter and John do is this. They say, don't look at us. Don't look at us. See the remarks of verse 12. Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power of holiness and walk? And very clearly, don't look at us, even though, of course, they were bold. Yet the message to the people was, don't look at us. It so happens, a very similar situation with Paul and Barnabas later on in this good book. And uh, they also healed a lame man as well, as it happens. And the people thought they were gods in Asia Minor there. And their response was what? They rent their clothes and protested. They rent their clothes and protested because they gave glory to man and to them. 
how important it is for us to understand these responses. Don't look on us is our message. That should go quite deep down into our spirits. Because we have been humbled and broken at Calvary. And the last thing we want is people to say, look at them. And for us to say, look on us. But how come you could have these two things side by side? Look on us and don't look on us. Well, there's no mystery here. They were filled with the Spirit. That boldness was of God. There is a natural need to stand up and be counted and to speak out. Otherwise, no man would ever enter the pulpit or nobody would ever venture to speak of Christ in case attention was given to us. We're not to be shrinking violets. We are to take our part. We are to say, look on us with confidence, a God-given confidence. But then, if any glory comes to us, we quickly say, don't look on us. Look on the one who is the power behind our words. It's so important we understand this in the depths of our hearts. Without Christ, we can do nothing. Who are we, my friend? Who are we? Sinners, have you forgotten your state when you came to Christ and Calvary? Have you forgotten that you are the chief of sinners? Have you forgotten the vileness of your sin, the depth of your sin? Uh, are you now so proud, uh, having gone on from Calvary, you've forgotten your first estate? No, we are unprofitable servants at the very best. And the thought of taking glory should be abominable, not just inadvisable, but abominable, truly abominable, like Saul and Barnabas. In a manner speaking, we should rend our clothes. The people give us the glory. That should be the response. I remember my father saying to me, Vernon Hyam, who was our pastor emeritus, and years ago, speaking to Martin Lloyd Jones, that well known great preacher uh, of some years ago, and having discussion about everything, and my father saying, you know those times when you're preaching and the Spirit is with you and giving you liberty and you're able to express the truths with power and then suddenly you begin to enjoy it and perhaps there's too much yourself in it and Lloyd-Jones said in a rather chilling way, get back, get back quickly. If you heard Lloyd-Jones, he says, those kind of principles very often. Uh, he even goes as far to say words like is prostitution. It is abominable, says Lloyd Jones. Shocking words like that, but because he is so abhorred by the thought that we should take the glory to ourselves rather than lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. It is abominable. It is awful. And hence you see response here of Peter and John, likewise Saul and Barnabas, these godly men who were humble men, who spoke boldly, but knew once the attention was on them, they had to correct it and say, no, don't look on us, look on Jesus. Indeed, that's what Peter does. And as we dip into this sermon, God willing, we shall look at this sermon more next Lord's Day. But here we see just those parts, at least, of this emphasis on Jesus Christ. And note these details, the way he lifts up Christ, mentions Christ time and time again. At the very outset, once he said in verse 12, in so many words, don't look at us. Then in verse 13, he says, look on Jesus. He mentions his name. That is important. Because we know what his name means to men. It's a power to his name. And it would have been, at this time especially, they knew the name Jesus. And there was an offense to it. And so he says, his son Jesus. His son Jesus, verse 13. Uh, the name of Jesus, 
can't fail to note the clarity here and the directness straight away Jesus Christ and of course he tells them that Jesus is the source of healing look to Jesus look on Jesus the source of healing verse 16 and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong and of course Jesus Christ during his ministry has showed his power over the body and over nature and again here he does through the apostles and this man also through his faith and so he gives credit to Jesus Christ and of course he said to the man anyway rise in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth but see also oh this blessed emphasis on Jesus and I trust you note these things and we begin to think of our Saviour the Lord Jesus Christ this evening and who he is and our hearts might be melted by the very mention of his name and the truths about him and there we find verses 17 and 18 uh, look to Jesus says Peter the one prophesied and he goes through the scriptures and there we find verse 18 uh, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets and then also verse 22 for Moses truly said unto the fathers a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren and verse 24 yea and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days and of course this carried weight and substance with the Jews he's going to the Old Testament saying Jesus was spoken of in the Old Testament this is he the one who was prophesied by the prophets and by the people but how he exalts him as well look to Jesus the glorified he says go back to verse 13 hath glorified his son Jesus he does not hold back he's not coy about this straight away he tells them right to their face it's not us it is the glorified son Jesus the son of who the son of God the father oh the truth the truth was being proclaimed wonderfully boldly and again the mark of the spirit this boldness the spirit will always exalt the son and so the mark of that in preaching is that Jesus is mentioned in verse 14 look to Jesus the Holy One and the just or the righteous oh the Holy One the Holy Jesus not just sinless he was without sin but he was righteous glorious you think of the transfiguration and that imagery of the brightness of his being as God and as man also the God man and then verse 15 dramatic phrase and killed the prince of life what a strange phrase that is and killed the prince of life but we not the prince of life oh the prince of life the one who is the king and the prince of life he is full of life himself he distributes life to his people and of course he must mention to them the Messiah and that will carry great power with the congregation there in the temple the Christ verse 18 the Christ the Messiah and he spoke of him as Jesus Christ Jesus the Messiah he is the Messiah he was amongst you but then the details of the events look to Jesus the crucified verse 13 again whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate and verse 15 and killed the prince of life but also look to Jesus the resurrection it goes on to say whom God hath raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses and Peter lays it out before them whom you crucified whom God raised even that combination 
like in this sermon where you challenge the people put into death the Son of God likewise here he does the same again he speaks the truth unflinchingly the truth of their sin and condemnation you crucified the Messiah but God raised him up again he says to them but then of course he comes to the heart of the matter here and there we find the gospel and the mercy of God and the offer of sins forgiven verse 19 repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins be blotted out he is the one who saves yes he did all this but don't think that this is the end of it he came for this purpose he came as a suffering servant to take upon himself the iniquities of his people to carry away their sin this was the blessed purpose of God the wonderful purpose of God he sent the Messiah to come and although you are guilty in putting him to death it was God's purpose and yes you are guilty but God overruled it because he is the lamb oh think of the lambs of the Old Testament and there in these very times in the temple and the sacrifice of the many lambs he is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world who blots out sin blotted out it says in verse 19 blots out sin it's a wonderful thing for sin to be removed you know our lives are quite a mess aren't they and like a copybook we have blots all over the pages and we might try to tidy them up but only spread a mess and make quite a hash of it all and that's what we do you know, as if we've got a mark on our shirt and we take some spittle or spit in hands and try to rub it off and it only makes it worse and it looks worse but here is one who can blot out our sin remove it it is a great miracle for sin to be so removed but that's why he came he came to remove and blot out our sin blot it out from the sight of God to take sin upon himself the judgment and death and to remove it from our account so that we are without sin think of that it's been blotted out if it's been blotted out it's gone and we are without sin and therefore we can know sin forgiven and also in the same breath he calls upon them to believe repent ye therefore be converted that your sins may be blotted out he says to them and so they are to take hold of Christ they are to acknowledge their sin before God and ask Christ to blot out their sins by believing in him by embracing him in their hearts by trusting with their very beings and of course there will be power in those words no doubt power and although men are prone to superficial believing and just say well yes I believe these men's souls will be touched and many no doubt would repent of their sin would feel it instantly on that occasion and would believe in Jesus Christ and in that moment their sins are blotted out but there we have such a full sermon here in verse 26 he says look on Jesus and be sanctified uh, he goes on to say unto you first God having raised up his son Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities it's not just the blotting out of sin but the turning away from our sinful ways now of course we shall always stumble and fall but there is a direction uh, we now we are stumbling and falling as we go away from the ways of the world not towards the world but away from the world and so we turn 
something has happened in our hearts. We are his. We belong to Jesus Christ. And we follow him. And also verse 19. Go back to that verse. Yes, look to Jesus and no blessing. When times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And also there in verse 26. Sent him to bless you. To bless you. Or are you feeling this evening unblessed? Are you feeling bereft? Empty? Is there a vacuum in your heart? But this is the man you need. The man Jesus, who is the son of God. He is blessing himself. The prince of life. The holy one, the righteous. He is unsearchable riches. He is the silver and gold you so desire. And in him you shall have Meaning, life, you shall have God himself. When you think of the amount of blessing in the person of Jesus Christ, think of this created world. What is this silver and gold? What is it? It's for a time and it's nothing really, is it? What can it buy you in the end? But when you have Jesus Christ, you think of not just the infinite being glory of Christ but also his beauty his life his light and all this he gives to his people and when they draw upon Christ they draw upon pure gold and pure silver not tainted by this world but the gold of heaven and of God and the silver of heaven and of God uh, which will enrich your soul now that is quite a thing you know or you can have houses and cars and second homes you can have nice clothes so on but you know you're only dressing yourself you're only surrounding yourself but what about you yourself you in your heart might know the unsearchable riches the unspeakable gift of Jesus Christ Oh, if you knew him, you would know of what I'm talking. Any time he draws near, all oh, our souls are warmed. It's life, isn't it? It's life. And when he's far, we feel as if we are impoverished. But when he comes again, he comes with light and life. He's not there on our beck and call, but he does graciously come. Sometimes, at times, when we least expect. But, you know, to seek him, to follow him, is a way to know these things. And in his good time, he will enrich your heart. Enrich, it in, enrich your heart in many ways. Uh, he'll enrich your heart with just that sanctification. How pure and clean it is and different to the world but also with his presence and person and there your heart will burn with his nearness going back to verse 6 this is the silver and gold the true silver and true gold and all we can say to those who are here this evening is the same as Peter said and John said so powerfully Yes, it's a sense, rightly, look on us, because they knew they had the gospel to speak. Don't look to others, look to us. I speak with the God-given boldness. I speak of Jesus. But then, don't look on us, and look on Jesus. And for those this evening, go back to verse 6. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I could repeat those words. I'm not thinking of those who might be lame, but might be lame in their souls. And I say to you this evening, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And you know you shall leap to your feet. This is the gospel. And you shall rise indeed to the presence of Almighty God. 
through Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. Yes, praising God and leaping. There is a happiness and a joy to salvation. Oh yes, other days will come. But those days will come again as well. When you are reminded and restored to the joy of your salvation. And he does, you know he does. And again you will leap. But not like you shall leap in heaven. Praise God. Because then there will be the fulfillment of it. And you shall know Jesus Christ, who died upon the cross, was buried, who rose from the grave, who was set at the right hand of God, who has all power in heaven and earth, and he calls you to himself. And the beginning of that is this leaping of the soul when you are saved. But it doesn't end there. He will bring you into his presence and you shall have everlasting light and everlasting life. Well, look on Jesus is our message this evening. Look on Jesus. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the name He's a name to be named because he is the Prince of Life. He is the Holy One and the Just. He is the Silver and the Gold. Well, let us pray. Our Father and our God, we pray that we might be rich indeed. When we think of our Lord Jesus Christ, he was and is the richest person in this world. And in him, we find he dispenses his riches to those who come to him. And the riches of salvation, the riches of sanctification, and the riches of his person and presence, and the riches of heaven. And we ask now this evening, O oh Lord, that we might in our hearts not rush on so quickly, but stay with our Savior and know his blessing and know the gold and the silver of the heart. O oh Lord, we pray uh, that we might have time, have time. We might learn from these men on how fixed they were on the gospel, how quickly they mentioned Jesus, that we might have time for Jesus Christ. We've been saved by him. We shall be with him forever. We trust now between our experience of Calvary and our experience of heaven, we shall be matched with him. Amen. Well, let's close our evening service with 306. Joy in all the glorious names of wisdom, love, and power. Hymn 306. Remain seated. Show the hymn, in which case I'll close with a benediction. Let's pray. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.